speed. Yeah, but and they said, okay, okay, we are changing the laws of the universe at all. There are dark matter, dark energy, 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 and so on. So they are not constant at all. No, no, our knowledge is not constant. But the rules are constant, and we are trying we to make that assumption. But that's a simple yes. kind of assumption. We we are doing cognitive science. We don't care about whatever reality is. We are concerned of what people talk about, which is that uh, we have embedded systems, embedded in the scope. Okay, what is outside uh, the God's reality? We don't care. We have no access to it. No. So the real rules of the universe, we don't care. What we care about are what people have in their head. Okay? So at some given moment, your claim is that the confidence into what they believe about the universe is more constant than what they believe of the uh, fact that the pilot is drunk or not. Yeah. But still, there are, uh, you need a lot of information to give to the world to generate a situation in which the pilot is drunk and still uh, yeah. uh, okay because co-pilot <coughs> should have gone unnoticed and uh, it was, uh, 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 there would, should have been a breach in uh, yeah. in the rules of deontology rules and so on. So you need a lot of information to to give to the world to produce this. Yeah, but the, we if we take the first aim of epistemology that's a science of knowledge, it's to solve problems. Uh, to try to solve problems and pro uh, solving problems in sciences is com in hard sciences is completely different as solving problem in human sciences and there may be as I'm not sure I, I don't see any qualitative difference no, no. <laughs> if you know one I will be interested you are a human scientist I'm originally uh, a natural scientist who is now more busy with human sciences but I can tell you they both have similar problems they are less pronounced in the one case but they are there as well <coughs> just to make the connection with hard sciences the question of probability uh, as I said Previously, I had the feeling that interesting, unexpected topics were improbable. And it worked from time to time, not always. And can we do the reverse, using the definition of unexpectedness to redefine probability, in which case we call it subjective probability. So I show you an example. Yeah. Yes. When will you explain the formula to this thing? It comes. This one. He likes formulas. <laughs> <laughs> so, objective probability says that if you throw two dice, uh, you have a certain probability of having two numbers, one out of, uh, haha, depends if you consider the sun or whatever. That's a big trickery about this game, which is that you know in advance what is relevant and what is not. So if you throw two dice, the game says, but where do you know uh, it from, that you shouldn't care about the position of the dice. You shouldn't care about the orientation of the dice. You shouldn't care about the humidity in the air of the room. You shouldn't care about the uh, orientation of two dice and so on. You should care only on what is written on the top of the two dice. Who said that? Okay? We were taught to... Okay. Otherwise, any situation has a zero probability to occur. Every situation in the world is unique. Probability zero. It won't happen again. So you must know what is relevant, what is not. In mathematics, that's a big trickery underlying the definition of probability in mathematics. You know in advance what you should attend to and what you should ignore. That's how probability may exist in mathematics. Yeah, you have a set of possible outcomes. Yes. But in reality, there is no set of possible outcomes because you cannot specify in advance what could happen and what exactly. could not happen. So you must have a set of possibilities, and when you consider subsets instead of unique events, that's that you generalize what happens. You by ignoring some dimension, you get a set instead of an instance. 
Okay? In real life, as you said, never happens. You don't know. So what are the relevant variables? So let me show you. Consider five coins. You throw the coins. So I'm not very good at it. It's just copy-paste. So just pretend that they are the face is not uh, the same one, okay? So five euros and you, the position is whatever position, the face is whatever the face and so on. You say boring, I don't care. I want to attract attention to it, okay? So, what, is this situation complex? Just by considering positions and face, what you have, you need two numbers to locate one coin on the table. If you have a certain precision, for instance, you need a one millimeter precision, uh, you need 10 numbers, 10 bits for each number. So you need 20 bits for each coin. You have five coins, so you need 100 bits. Okay? 20 numbers, uh, no, sorry, uh, 10 numbers, 100 bits. Okay. Do it again. What? And all coins end up aligned. Wow, marvelous. You know it. You know that it's incredible. Hey, mom, come look at this. I just throw the coins in. Okay. Uh, and uh, what you do here, uh, what we can see is that this situation is simpler. Because, what, because you need less numbers to describe it. You need two numbers for the first coin. Then one, one number for the angle, and then just numbers for the gap between them. If you count them, you're two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven numbers, you spared three numbers, 30 bits. Sorry, yes. So, you sp sorry, you spare 30 bits, which means that by the same token, you know what, that's, it's interesting, and you know what, you know that the position is relevant. You know that if the face are different, it's not relevant. But if the face are the same, then it becomes relevant because something is relevant if it generates compression. Okay. And then you can convert it into probability. So unexpectedness is the difference between what you expect, what you get. And you convert it into probability by saying one bit of unexpectedness is the same as the probability of uh, flipping a coin. Okay? So this is P equals 2, 2 minus U. Okay? If you have 10 bits of unexpectedness, then you have 2, 2 minus 10 probability of getting it. But it's so the C are also in bits? Yes. Mm -hmm. CW and C are all in bits. It's a number yeah, the, of bits. The, 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 the length of the description exactly. that you need in short. Sure. Okay. You, you measure everything in bits. Yeah, so in okay. bit you, if, if bits is the is the, the units, then you get the probability if you yes. do the minus. Exactly. And uh, you have a feeling what uh, subjective probability is. So you have to be careful because it's ex post probability. You have to distinguish ex ante probability, ex post probability. Normal probability theory only deals with ex ante probability. What, will, what is the probability that this event will take place? And you describe the event and you know everything uh, which is relevant to observe and so on. In this case, we, we compute the probability ex post. What was the probability that this event should occur? Okay. Uh, that's a difference, especially in the case of uh, nu nuclear plants, you know. The ex ante probability for uh, 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 every time there is a problem in a nuclear plant, some journalists say, oh, there was only one in uh, many millions uh, chances that uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, yeah. accident should occur. But that is also because there is a lack of knowledge of the complex situation. Uh, when you see what happened in Fukushima, um, nuclear uh, scientists said, we never thought that would could be possible. Mm -hmm. Every it happens. It happens because their broad uh, view on what could happen was not broad enough. That, that's no, the it's also because you don't know in advance what is relevant and what is not. Yeah. Well, so yeah, if you take exactly. in account everything, all the information, probability is always zero. 
on n'y avait pas pensé. On n'y avait pas pensé. So, ex post, you have not the same problem. Ex post, you know what is relevant. Mm -hmm. Everything that generates compression is relevant. And then you are able to compute a probability ex post. This is given by this formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. To get back to your very first words, are you not talking about linguistics or about preferences? I'm talking about what uh, people talk about. In that example, could you? Yes. Yeah. What makes uh, a situation worth t telling about? Yes, I am. I mean, this to me seems all the systems below what I'm saying. It's not it's content, it's, 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 it's all systems. Yeah. But in the thing, yeah. but I don't yeah. get the, 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 the meaning out of it. I mean, it's a system which generates that n utterances, whatever possible. I will try to get the point. Uh, the problem, what we talk about, you have an event. Should I mention it or not? You have a binary decision. So this is what I'm trying to capture. Your decision, should I talk about this, this uh, you know, picture or not? But here you are trying to explain how to compute the event. Yeah. Com not, not the event. Ah, yes, in CW. Yeah. Ex post, you know how, uh, how did the world produce that event. So you must know as, as a subject, as a talking subject, you must have an idea of how the world produced that event. Otherwise, you are not interested in anything. Okay. You, you, you must be surprised. To be surprised, you must have expectations, and this expectation must, must be deceived in some way. How do I get the aha effect then? I'm exactly that, that way. Mm -hmm. Aha effect is exactly this. Good. Well, not exactly. Haha -ha effect in the case of uh, a puzzle. So some, something which is, appears to be impossible. So CW is very high. Mm -hmm. And then you get your explanation, drops down to very simple things. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, so the haha -ha effect mm -hmm. is, a very, it is exactly the same rule, but in the case of epistemic puzzle, which is, oh, uh, uh, a situation in, in which the CW is high because you, you think it's impossible, you can't solve it, and then you get a solution. Wow. Yeah. But in, as anthropologists, we, we make a difference between performative language and pleasure language. I would say, for example, um, uh, you, if you have to get out of a, an airport because there is a danger, there is a sign, it must be very performative and everybody has to understand that there is um, an, an arrow and a, a cube and that you have to go this way. So this performance language has to be as uh, open and understood by everybody. If I go and visit my grandmother just for the pleasure that she, she has social contact what we are talking about has no importance because what uh, happens and what is important is exchanging with her some emotions but the content is, is not relevant and so that's maybe the difference between performative yes. language and uh, pleasure language like the Freudians say you have a principle of reality where you have to cope with this reality and then you have a principle of pleasure where the content is not important. Okay. So I agree with you except that I reversed, I'm reversing the picture. What is important is what you call pleasure language. Yeah. Your social existence is at stake. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Talk with your grandmother is crucial. Yeah. Everything else is almost what it's called performative language, yeah. is almost non-existent, quantitatively. You speak every day some 16,000 words. Yeah. How many of them are performative? Virtually nothing. It's, uh, for philosophers and science, it's very important because they want to, okay. But that's a complete, uh, complete prejudice to me. Language is behavior, is massive behavior, 16,000 words a day. This is language, that's chatter, okay? Your social existence is at stake. Uh, it's social existence is, except in our society, otherwise it's your survival. In a normal society, without police, without justice, you just survive because you have social existence. Yeah. So language is about this, and perf performatives, like orders, like the, 
are completely marginal. So I agree with you, but I'm reversing the, the picture. Yeah, but when my wife say you should wash the dishes, uh, I can assure you that it's performative. Yes, <laughs> I agree. I agree. No, just count count the equations. On the contrary, everything that she is doing thereafter goes back to have you washed the dishes. <laughs> Yes. I, I'm not sure. Just take your recorder and count the number of occasions in which you are the equivalent to wash the dishes in a day. It's non-existent. So that's, I know that in textbooks, people only speak about this. Yeah. But the, the, those people never use the, the, the recorder. Mm. You see what the kind of stories I, I showed. Mm stories about the McDonald's, about uh, the fact that she, she beat her father. There's no wash the dishes there, no orders, no performatives, only stories. Stories and logical discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay? Everything else, to me, is artifact, of, uh, academic artifacts. I don't know, it's, I'm not saying it's non-existent. Mm -hmm. I said it's a tiny part of huge phenomenon. It's sad that you say that because last year we had a, a seminar about speech acts where the speaker was claiming that speech acts are the most important thing in the social world and everything is built out of speech acts. And the speech act, I suppose that's what you would call a performative language. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. To perform well. I don't know any, I know a few, but take a recorder and then what, what uh, speech act theorists would say about the kind of conversation we saw at the beginning is that there are speech acts because it's, you cannot refute this kind of theory. Speech, everything is speech act. But they go into the garbage categories, which is assertives. And so they, they don't predict anything about this, this conversation. They predict things about orders. That, that's what, okay, I'm not sure I'm, able to, uh, I'm allowed to say it, but to me it's what I call military pram pragmatics. Okay. Yeah. Orders, you obey, yeah. something. Yeah. That's not everyday life. But I, I would extend it to what cognitive science typically does is it looks at information in the sense of giving you some information that you were waiting for. Mm -hmm. Like, you have a question, you get an answer. That's information. What I think is that our perceptual and cognitive apparatus is built up is not to get answers to questions, but rather to get free information. That means things that may potentially be relevant. Most of those are not relevant, but it's good to know them. And what you, your examples that you give, where people tell stories, these are stories that are good to know. And you, you may not have any use with them. That means they don't tell you that you should do certain things in certain ways. But maybe at some stage you might get in a similar situation where you are interviewed for a job and that you remember to say, I should make sure that I don't make a mistake and mention yeah. the, the, the competitor of the company. So I think our cognitive system is much more open ended than most people think. It is kind of storing all kinds of things that may someday possibly be useful, but probably won't be. Yeah. And it just and yet, things. yet the rule of the game... The, 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 use, the use does not need to be clear from the beginning. No, I, I agree with you that we don't care what to use. You, um, former theories of language were utilitarian. And more and more we consider uh, the theories of language which, which are more like signal. You signal them. More, and you, you, you take the topic as, as an excuse. In this case, you take the topic as an excuse to show that you are able to produce unexpectedness. So what you produce unexpectedness about is just not very, not so interesting afterwards, after all. So the point, it, it gives me a good transition with my next uh, slide. Okay, can come here. Which is the issue I, I won't uh, address today, but because of lack of some time. But why do human be beings care so much about unexpectedness? I and if an I animal... I have lots of about that, yeah. but I first want to give you an answer. No, I won't give an answer, but uh, <laughs> not today. But even if animals care, they don't care as much as we do. And anyway, we, why are we talking about it? <coughs> animals don't. 
free. So the idea behind this, my, uh, just to give the flavor of my answer about it, is that uh, it's a case of altruistic communication. You give information to others. So it's not a question about the listeners. We don't care about listeners. Of course, listeners can get, if information is honest, is interesting, you, you have some interest uh, in listening to it. The big issue, big question is why talk, not why listen? So why are people taking so much pain? Remember, 16,000 words spoken a day. Why take so much pain, cost, time, and so on, to give information to others? And the traditional explanations are useless here. Okay, I might disagree about the last one, but kin selection doesn't work in our species when we talk uh, outside of the family. Group selection, uh, as many other people, I think that group selection doesn't apply in any context. Reciprocal cooperation doesn't apply to language because we are not exchanging uh, information as we are exchanging secrets. To, 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 okay, uh, we are talking a lot. Many people are very talkative. 16,000 words a day. Okay. So my answer is costis in nine. So uh, the only way I have to it, make it work is to say that uh, what we do it to signal and what we talk about is just an excuse to show that we are able to produce an expectedness. So this is my story, which is written in a book if you are interested. The book is called Why We Talk. Okay. And maybe I should come to my conclusion now. Okay. Uh, and then we can discuss. Just before this, an announcement about next week. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so uh, Olivier will talk about the uh, poetic generator, and as far as I understand, he will make a link with uh, simplicity theory. Okay, and I, it's obvious that there is a link. Next week, same hour, same same place, I guess. And my conclusion, my conclusions, and then we can discuss. So my my point is that our mind. Our minds function as compressing machines. Maybe uh, for chimps is the same, I don't know. And we, we don't know, I guess. It would be good news if the same for chimps. But the difference with chimps is that we go public with it. Okay? Every time we see a situation which, which is abnormally simple, we have the reflex of saying it, which is unique, as far as we know, in nature. Only our species does it. So uh, we react to situations which are unexpected, that are hard to generate and simple to describe. You have two conditions, but if you are interested in a gap between two computations of complexity. And then we, you get the, the formula if you want to convert unexpectedness into probability. And this is written, unfortunately, in French in a book which is called La Pertinence et ses origines cognitives. Uh, and, uh, and you have this website at the bottom in which the uh, Omnitor is everything, uh, all my examples and a lot of others, if you are interested to go a little bit far. Okay, thank you very much. First, but no, no, okay. Uh, we can remark about what you said about the 16,000 words, words that we um, use to, um, every day. Francoise Dolto said, if you speak less than 5,000 words, you will become depressed because you have no social contact. And so I think maybe it's a kind of machine that has to be um, used because otherwise. You feel you feel bad, and uh, that's maybe also one of the purposes of language. Ah, yes, a proximal purpose. So the yeah. question is, why do we need to talk? That's exactly well, the question. Take the machine because the machine is is working. No, and the, when you the feel question alone, is, why is a machine designed to do it? That's the question. Okay, you you see why us and not teams. So why are we? La fonction entre l'organe. La fonction entre l'organe. Pas au début. 
Come not, not at the beginning. You have to give. Uh, you, everything you do is because you enjoy it. Okay, you have sexual relations between you because you enjoy it. But no biologist would, would accept an answer to the question why are we having sexual relations in terms of because we, we like to do it. No, the biologists want uh, an answer which is connected to reproduction. So the question is why do, are we descending from ancestors we were behaving like this? Okay, that's, that's a biological question. Okay. The proximal answers in terms of, uh, of uh, pleasure and so on can be given for a, 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 every, every human behavior, of course, but uh, what we need is a biological answer. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yes, um, more uh, suggestions and a uh, question for um, I remember the idea that there are some uh, attempts to generalize more the Kolmogorov uh, complexity to a kind of context relative to something I don't know if you are aware of this, but this might be helpful to quantify some things you want to quantify. Could you be more precise? I'm not sure. Uh, I could, I could search. I mean, yes, you search if you have a reference, I, I, I like saw like in probability theories, oh. like, you know, with a slash, uh, the complexity of this knowing. Yes, conditional complexity. Conditional, of yeah. course, I use it every, every time. Okay, I should have shown it. You, I show you an example about coincidences. Uh, I wanted to show it. You know this example about Lincoln and Kennedy? Uh, President Lincoln, President Kennedy, uh, they, they were elected one century apart. They were elected as president one century apart. Okay. Both presidents have been shot in the head in the presence of their wives. Both successors were named Johnson, born one century apart. Kenny was shot in a car named Lincoln. If you want the complete list, go to the web. <laughs> okay, you can draw. So, there, um, it's not a question about reality, because some authors showed, showed it's easy to draw such a parallel when you know everything there is to know about lives. So they tried to do it with two other presidents. But that's not the issue. The issue is why are we impressed by this? Okay? And what you have to explain is the role of the close analogy. Why is a close analogy impressive? Why, uh, in the case of the car named Lincoln, it's not in the analogy, it's just association. It still belongs to the, it contributes to the amazement. The role of round numbers, why is one century apart more interesting than 97 apart? And you will see the conditional complexity arrive. Okay? And the role of prominence, it would be, have been less interesting if it would have been two obscure presidents of Guatemala instead of Kennedy and Lincoln, which are in the top five best known the uh, president of the most prominent uh, nation in the world. Okay. So here you have the idea is that an expectedness of the double, the double event is different between the complexity of generating it minus complexity of describing it. By definition of independence, that's the correct definition of independence. Complexity of generating the double event is the sum of the two complexities of generating each of the events. That's the only correct definition of independence. If you believe that the correct definition is in terms of probability, you are in error. That's a good definition, correct definition. And then, but when you are describing a double event, you can use one to describe the other. And here you see conditional complexity. And of course, if the two events are similar, you can use this, this amount is much smaller than the complexity of describing E2. Because you can reuse uh, uh, some parts of the description of E1 to describe E2. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you utilize the condition in probability in the second part, you should be able to use it in the first part. No, no, no. You, you say that the. Um, okay. 
you remember, you should notice that I put greater than. So, which means that I, I introduce a constraint on the description. I say in order to in order to describe E1 and E2 together, I put a constraint, I say I start describing E1 and then I can use E1 to describe E2. So that's why there is a, a inequality here. But I, uh, with this, I, uh, uh, so, uh, I could get rid of this, C1 and C2. In this case, I, uh, it would have been even worse. Okay. But that's just local. The competition of this can be described like that. It's just in terms of computation, it's like in a computer science. You can use a description as an input of your program. It's already there. So the, the notion of conditional complexity is much simpler, much more obvious than the definition of conditional probability. Conditional probability is a ratio, something which is complicated. In case of uh, uh, complexity, it's just that you can use E1 as an input of the shortest program that describes E2. So E1 is taken for, uh, for free. Get E1 for free. That's the meaning of this vertical bar. Sorry. Mm -hmm. oh. <coughs> okay, the meaning of the vertical bar is that in this computation, E1 is free for the computation. Is that the, the standard definition of conditional complexity? Mm -hmm. And another suggestion um, would be to how the, the, the generation of, uh, say, unexpected is something uh, hard to generate. Um, have you thought of using uh, the metric of logical depth of Charles Bennett? Yeah. Because it well, takes to uh, account the computation, that the, the computation time, that's a big yes. difference with the uh, column uh, So the topic comes quite often. and. Uh, up, so I have this kind of dispute, especially with uh, Jean-Paul Delay. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, till now, uh, logical depth, so the time of the computation, is irrelevant. I don't need it. I don't see how it, uh, it can intervene. Okay? So that's even the strong point of this, is that it doesn't use the computation time. Mm -hmm. Up to now, I don't know, but uh, okay, it's still irrelevant to this uh, issue. It's a very important notion, notion of logical depth, in other contexts. Up to now, not, not in this one. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, about the relation between um, unexpectedness, generation, and description, um, we as anthropologists use the figure of imagination trying all kinds of new ways of invention and they are of course mythological because they are not um, going to reality but then uh, with the Greek they started to say okay uh, we have the myths but we have also reality and they started with the hard sciences with Aristotle and so but the problem, imagination is still there to find all kinds of uh, um, descriptions who are close to those uh, figures here. But in fact, the problem is that this imagination uses symbols just for the pleasure to try all kinds of games. Huh? And then, in sciences, find realities, and in other fields, like arts, always changing the pleasure. And that's maybe difference in generation and description and the unexpectedness where imagination wants always something different and something new because well it's adventure of the spirit uh, uh, we go somewhere where we have never been we go to the moon we go to abstract art we go where we we think we should go because it's unexpected as adventure of the spirit exactly i agree with you yeah. fully and maybe, uh, coming back to what you said earlier, there are two different styles, the artists and the scientists say, yeah. would be two, two, two different ways to unexpectedness. Yeah. Uh, in the case of scientists, not always, but quite often we, we take something which is like a puzzle, which is a, with high CW, uh, high CW, 
and we try to find an explanation, diminish it, and then we, we get our drop. And uh, the artist, the artist is trying to produce things and then just whether by chance there is something which is abnormally simple, um, there's no uh, pre-existing problem in the case of the artist. Yeah. But it reminds me of the first guy, uh, maybe, uh, but it reminds me of the first guy who did a monochrome. Yeah. That's a complexity drop. Yeah. Okay, look at this. You didn't expect something yeah. that simple. Yeah. It, it works only the first time, you know, because when you are seeing your uh, uh, 20th uh, monochrome, it's boring because you have to pay the complexity of discriminating all the. Okay. But the, the first time, it's uh, the, the simplest uh, picture ever. Wow. The idea is fantastic. Well, I, I won't swear that I will stand in front of the monochrome during 10 hours uh, or, or buying one to, to put in my, in my room. But uh, anyway, it, it, it's a case in it's which. It's an opening yeah. of mind in yeah. a new view of what the things are. Yes. That's it. Yes. That's the important I agree. And uh, this kind I would like to explore. Uh, this kind of difference uh, in creativity. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, and that's the yes. uh, I think indeed that insight that I expect that this brings you beyond all things you know and that no generator can can, can generate. And how do you, where does it work? This has nothing to do with answers. No, it's a cognitive event. Surely, cognitive. Yeah, uh, everything can... Emotional as well. Yeah, it, and, and all this, the point is that when you have this kind of haha -ha experiment, if there is someone around, you say, hey, <laughs> you must communicate about it. So that's why, starting from language, from the study of what people talk about, I uh, came to the theory which is, uh, I would say, um, the theory itself is purely cognitive, mm -hmm. but it predicts it predicts what people talk about. Maybe we're not talking about the same thing, but I have an R effect. I can communicate to the person says, "Come and see," because it's unseen. You can communicate what yeah, it's yeah, about. But, uh, when somebody, when Einstein or whoever had the inside E times C square, how do you communicate? That? But you wrote the papers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, Sure, I cannot say, hey, look at sure. that. Sure. But sure. remember the story about the McDonald's. The story was quite long because you need a lot of prerequisites in order to be able to measure the unexpectedness. So she had to explain that she had, she had one, uh, one, uh, uh, one week of training. It is relevant, the week of training, because it, 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 there is conjecture that in a normal story like this, oral story, everything is relevant. Everything is designed to make the complexity drop maximum. So the week of training is worth telling because it makes the expectation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the um, error smaller. Uh, just, just thought that. So um, you get the story of the things that make something interesting to talk about in the story, this is a hard story, uh, and then you're, you, you say, uh, you give costly signaling as, as a, like the ultimate reason for the existence of that, but is that the whole answer to the question why do we talk so much, uh, would be my question, because I, I could imagine that there's a lot of talk that happens which is actually not done telling a story. Not, yeah. It's not telling a surprising story. Or with painting, there's a lot of paintings that people paint and buy that are not surprising at all. They are more like comforting because they are similar to what you've seen before. So I think a lot of talk happens as well mm -hmm. for other reasons than costly signaling. It's maybe more, you know, in the, the group die rein, reinforcement or something like that. So I, I, it seems right what you were saying, but it doesn't seem the whole answer to why do we talk so much? Reinforcement of the group, cohesion and so on, uh, synchronized grants do the job perfectly. So synchronized, synchronized grants, mm -hmm. the kind of thing that uh, monkeys do works perfectly. So uh, what we have, we must have a theory of how uh, language, uh, why language is how it is. So you're right to point to the fact that not all language is about telling stories. 
uh, why did I put stress on stories? Because until recently, until the 21st century, very few authors uh, observed the importance of storytelling in everyday conversation. Okay. It might be one third, one half of your speaking time telling stories. Do you know what happened to me yesterday and so on? And you have things, most stories are uh, told in uh, story rounds. One story coming in next. Oh, the same happened to me and so on in the next story. And it can last for minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour or so. But you're right that, uh, especially in my corpus, I, I have a large corpus of conversations, it's, uh, it's, um, stories are only 25%. The huge part is uh, uh, what we call in French argumentation. Shouldn't translate by argu arguing in English because arguing there is some kind of dispute. Yeah. So let's call it uh, logical, logic, collective reasoning, something like logical discussion. This is a ma major part. That's what we are doing now. Yeah. We are not doing stories. And this, uh, uh, it's not incompatible with the fact that it's still costly thing. Mm. Okay, but you're right to, to point to the fact that it's not storytelling. What is at stake is not unexpectedness, it's consistency. Okay, which is another story. I didn't talk much about it. It's making, uh, trying to point to inconsistencies, what you do when you ask a question most of the time. And I try to show that I remain consistent. Okay, logically consistent. So uh, logical uh, discussion is about consistency. But it's still signaling. Yeah. But could you elaborate why you see this costly signaling? Because costly signaling is kind of an explanation for anything that you can't explain by more straightforward things. Oh no, it's a very constrained model. Very difficult to explain something with costly signaling. So I can go into it, but in three minutes it's difficult. Okay. Uh, it's, so, it's social signaling. That you, the point is that you emit a signal in order to uh, establish social bonds. So I just take an example with the, uh, what people, birds. Birds do so, uh, have a behavior which is called mobbing. So because this signaling theory comes from uh, Amos Zahavi. Zahavi is an ethologist, you know about him. He studied this kind of small birds which are called the babblers. They live in the desert. Okay, in the desert, uh, when a snake is coming, the, mo the, the, the the birds come to the snake and mob it, which means they circle around the snake and pretend to bite the snake, and the snake is stopping. Okay, and uh, it's very dangerous for 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 the babbler. So that's very strange. From Darwinian point of view, we don't understand why uh, they do it because uh, it seems at uh, at uh, face value that the best strategy is to mob five centimeters behind the others, okay? And after a few generations, if, if the best strategy is to mob behind the others, you don't have any mobbing uh, left. So the argument of Sahabi is to say that if barbers are showing their bravery in mobbing the snake, is to get prestige. This part of the explanation, the hard part of the explanation is why do all the babblers give prestige to courageous, to brave babblers? And you know, you must know something about the ecology of babblers. I tell a story about babblers because you will recognize our own species behind it. Yeah. Uh, the babblers are living in bushes. It's uh, uh, to, to escape from predators. What's the worst enemy of a babbler? The babbler, the enemy of a babbler is not a predator. The life expectancy of a babbler is 60 years in a bush. But outside of a bush, the life expectancy of a babbler is two years. Okay. What's the worst enemy of a babbler? The babblers of the next bush that want to push them again from the bush. So what babblers have to do from birth to, to death is to choose the best friends. Okay? Friends which are able to defend the bush against the other babblers. Okay. So what, and this generates a competition which is a signaling competition. 
Babblers show their bravery. They, the poor snake has, is not a real danger. The poor snake is just an excuse for babblers to, to show off, to signal that they are brave. That's why they are in front of the line in order to be as close as they can from the snake. And they show off their quality. And what we take uh, as altruism, that we, uh, we may confound with altruism, is just signaling. They signal their ability to be brave. Because the D-Day, when the, other, uh, the enemy's barbarous enemy will attack the bush, they have to be brave in order to defend the bush against the enemy. So this is signaling. My point is what we do with language is exactly the same. We are taking any topic as an excuse to show off our ability to detect unexpectedness yeah. and, to de and to remain consistent, yeah, which is not a problem. Yeah. Sorry? It's a very strong statement. Yeah. Yes, but we need strong statements because yeah. language, the existence of language is still a mystery. We don't have any consistent theory of why language does exist. Yes, if you are speaking about why this use of language exists, it does not mean that all that language emerged in that way. It could be co-opted, yeah. exaltation that yeah. it evolved to some different purpose sure. and then was used to this purpose. <laughs> no, but now I understand better Six, what you mean 16, by, uh, words a day. by the costly signaling, but I still think it's only part of the, uh, the solution. I don't see what's so wrong about reciprocal altruism. If I tell you some interesting bit of news and I kind of expect that you will tell me an interesting bit of news the moment you have one with me about profits. The problem is reciprocal reciprocity is we don't have any, one single stable model of it. It's always invaded by cheaters. Okay, no, so but in, 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 in a small group that doesn't happen and, uh, and, and it's the same with the costly signaling. The costly signaling in a small group it's stable. Have a small group. We have stable models. We have stable models, we don't have stable models of cooperation. And cooperation doesn't fit with language. The cheating detection in the case of language is performed by listeners, by, not by speakers, which is a reverse picture of what we expect. So, uh, in the case of... Uh, uh, but there is a problem called altruism. If you don't tell any stories to anybody, people will not tell stories to you. That is the way that the stability mechanism. Yeah. Yes, but it, language doesn't work that way. Language. Why not? I mean, if some guy never talks, I'm not going to talk. Yeah, but there is. Okay, Dunbar says the contrary. Okay, when you look at what many people are very talkative, they are very silent people, and uh, so it ranges from zero to fifty thousand. Okay. And the point is that there are much the more. The this may be, but the interesting is that's another matter. The, the people who talk most are usually not the that's ones who are the most unexpected. I completely agree. You, you come to my point, which yeah. is it's a competition not of quantity but of relevance. And people go to each other that way. Relevance and survival, because when you see the, the story of the bonobos and the chimpanzees or the orangutans, there is the story of aggression or the story of cooperation. And um, they claim that for the bonobos, they were able to favor cooperation between them, and that in other tribes, like the orangutans and the gorillas, aggression is the, the, the master of the system, while by the bonobos, it's cooperation and reciprocal altruism is a kind of try of surviving because we know that if we are all in aggression we are going to disappear and maybe it's a, a, a trick to, to survive. Yeah. The point is that we still expect the first undisputable example of reciprocal cooperation observed in nature. We thought we had it with bats, uh, the, you know, the vampire bats, and it, now it's uh, a lot discussed. It, it seems to be more keen selection. So we still are expecting one single example of reciprocal cooperation, and bonobos are definitely no, not. No, no. Uh, language is the first proof that that's reciprocal cooperation. We have I, to I, agree I, about it. Just, I just said that it was just in nine, not. No, but language, if I say yes or no, 
it's a, a reciprocal uh, agreement about what means yes and what means no. Yes, coordination is not reciprocal cooperation. Reciprocal cooperation is something, every time you have something which is costly, why would, it, would you give it for free to competitors? That's a big problem. I, I don't think there is, a, there is a, a, a clear separation between reciprocal altruism or what you call costly signaling. The reciprocal altruist, in my view, is somebody who gives something costly without guarantee that he will get something in return. But typically, on average, he does get things in return because a person that tells lots of interesting stories, people will also tell him stories. So, so you could say, on the one hand, he does it for the yes, prestige. On the other hand, you can say he does it in the expectation of his yes. The difference is one of Why the models. Why is the difference? One, the difference is one of the models is stable, the other one is not. But the models are models in game theory, and yes. game theory makes a lot of simplifications that are yes. not so nice in I, the I fully world. agree. That's science. So, uh, That's science. We, I, we are st I agree. If you are able to find a model, I mean, if, you make, if you make a model of a fit for touch, that's a couple of prisoners, they are not a medical call algorithm it seems to work. No, it's a simplified one. Tit for tat is unstable. No. It's invaded by cheaters. No, it's not unstable if you allow uh, mutations. Tit for tat. What you get is a tit for tat, it gets invaded for power by cheaters. When the cheaters become. Uh, no. This one that is invaded first by complete altruists who don't care about the, the, the that, and then they are exploited by cheaters. Mm -hmm. But then the tit for that again diminishes the cheaters because the tit for that have an advantage uh, uh, compared mm -hmm. to the cheaters. Yeah. Nothing is completely stable, but tit for that is pretty robust, more robust than, than cheaters. But it, it, it's uh, you don't get a section pressure from this. That's the point. The, and the first point is that is um, um, okay. We can discuss the stability through time. You have oscillations and things like that. But the second point, I have two points on this. That it doesn't apply to language. If you look at the reality of language, it's an economy of offer. Language there are many mouths ready to talk and very few ears to listen. As some people say, what people no, scientists scientists compete to give talks at conferences. They don't compete to listen. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I agree, but there are other. I mean, I have I have looked at the same problem from a different angle. I have looked at it from the angle of in the internet. You have all the kind of different social media. Why do people contribute to social media? It's the same problem about why do people exactly. write Wikipedia pages? Very good point. In the case of Wikipedia page, your, your, your principle of, of cost listening doesn't work because Wikipedia is anonymous. No. You contribute, but they, people don't see it was you con no. contributed. No, no, that's a very, a very important point. So, but, I would like to, maybe you know more about it. Did, did you study Wikipedia already? Because yeah. there is, there is, so you, you, you will say if I'm wrong, uh, people, the 90% the, um, of the pages were uh, written by 10% of the, of the contributors. So yeah. and, and those the most, especially in different different topics, the, the most um, uh, productive uh, contributors know each other, at least by their pseudo. So they knew each other. It's small, uh, small, and they know who who did what, and they have exactly as in the forums, they there is they have a rank to they have to show uh, expertise and so on. It's not anonymous at all. No, no, I mean, the moment your community gets more established, it becomes less and less anonymous. Yes. There are certain social dynamics that as long as like, exactly. interaction goes on long enough, it will appear. Yes. But Wikipedia emerged even without that. And most of the text, you may say, okay, 10% of the people write 90% of the text, but those not percent they don't know each other. Because 1% of all the people who no, are still millions of people. No, no, not an even topic. In a smaller area, no, I, I have, people I, I come have to know each other. I have, I have a different one of this, which is that what is the use in expressing information or ideas that you have to a public that may or may not listen? The use is that you get feedback. If you say something stupid, somebody is bound to correct you. If you say something that's incomplete, somebody is about to say, yeah, but you should make the next step. Why do you give talks? Because you expect feedback from us. This feedback is extremely useful for you. Yes. 
but that's not true. It's, it has less to do. If I give a talk, I could do it for the prestige. Most scientists, I think, they give talks because they want to know what I'm saying. Does it make sense? Have I forgotten? It's not incompatible. Have I have I overlooked things? You get yeah. feedback. It's extremely useful feedback. Sure. You can only get feedback if you talk about it. Yeah. And if you make it interesting, because otherwise people wouldn't listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's something special. Special. And yeah. it actually, your theory reinforces that point of view. That is that people like to speak about unexpected things. But the unexpected things are also kind of the things that are the least reliable. An unexpected thing is something exceptional, something that you think about. Did I see that one? Did that really happen? Have I missed something? And by telling it to people, hope to get the feedback that tells you, no, no, you missed it, but it wasn't a UFO, it was just a cloud. I said, oh yeah, yeah, maybe it was really a UFO. You, that is what you are expecting. And the more unexpected the story, the more you need that feedback. Because the more you want to know what was it really that happened. Is it really so strange as I think it is? It's not incompatible, I'm not sure it's a private yes. order. I think that is a problem. I think it's so much are, more. I think that's more logical than what you would do with just yeah. prestige. Uh, but you have a problem with second order altruism. Why should you debug the knowledge of others? Again, because yeah. it's it's cooperative. I mean, you come because you get feedback yes. on your feedback. Yes, it, you, 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 you are. See, that, that is how we can be. You, you are still in demand. So well. yes. But each builds on top of what the other does and everybody profits. That's the second mechanism that I speak about. Maybe I should just a bit stick energy. <coughs> that termites build then. That's what happens yes, is that the activity of the one stimulates the activity of the others and they all profit because the one builds on top of the other and they can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. But in Wikipedia you can't write an encyclopedia like that alone or even with the small you need people to contribute, and they contribute by building on top of what the others do. And the more there is, the more you're enticed to add your little thing. Because the more you're profiting from it, the more there is, the more you're stimulated to add. And also, the more you expect that people will build firm on what you have built. There's an expectation that if Wikipedia is progressive, that it will continue to progress. So if you add one little stuff, then maybe people will build from your little stuff and make it better. But would you explain why people are competing to do it? You know, in, in, in the in the in the cost discipline framework, the, the, the competition is, is predicted. In the cooperation framework, it's not there is both that's a contrary. No, no, there is not competition in cooperation. I mean all models are trying to reduce people or any social species to purely competitors or purely cooperators, they always get into trouble. No, competition. Are no, no, no. They compete sometimes. There is misunderstanding. Sometimes. Competition in, in cooperation. Yeah. People. You can <coughs> compete in cooperation. Yes, that's yeah. one of the. Yeah. But don't say it's obvious. Yeah. It, yeah. We still need a, a already a stable model of cooperation, and we it would be even more difficult to have. There are a few papers about this, especially by Barclay, to explain why people might be uh, competitive in cooperation. But it's very hard to do, and we are, it's still very, uh, to, to me, it's very shaky, and in a way it doesn't apply to the language. But we might differ about it. No, no, no. Competition and cooperation is strange. People yeah. compete to, to, to give explanation to on forums, yeah. they yeah. compete yeah. To, yeah. to give explanation yeah. in yeah. Wikipedia, they devote a huge amount of time, huge amount of energy, huge amount of, uh, uh, of resources, and uh, cooperation doesn't uh, predict it. No, there, Not at all. There is a new term. Yeah, yeah cooperation. Yeah, there, is a, there is a new term invented by the startup in America. It's frenemies. Friend enemies. We are friends and have to cooperate, but we are enemies to get parts of the, the market. And I think that's just what happens and what we analyze as anthropologists is that you have in your um, personality a narcissistic part where you want to become famous, become powerful, and you have socialized potions where you want to cooperate with the others. And everybody is playing that kind of game, and you see it even between neoliberalism and communism, they are the two extremes of uh, full cooperation and um, individualism. But frenemies is maybe that invention of that new word that says, well, 
we are all together enemies because we want to, to fight against each other, but we have to cooperate for um, inventing new uh, stuffs and uh, new uh, products and so. There is the, the core of the problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, when people are cooperating and the cheater comes and gets information, doesn't give anything in return, the, the cheater is winning. No, yeah. no, because the cheater is typically ostracized. Uh, yes, but not it's always, costly to ostracize always, someone. Always, always. Yeah. You, have, you have a second order cooperation game that who does the police? That, 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 but that's, that's the point of the reputation game. People want to have a reputation and they get the reputation well, yeah, by prestige. By that's prestige signal. Yeah. That's you, can call, signal. You, you can call it like yes. that, but it's. Uh, in the case of you, you can say costly signaling is in order to get cooperation, but what gets, why not get rid of the story about cooperation if it's all about reputation? That's the point of costly signaling theory. Oh, you no, the reputation. No, no, the reputation. What you forget is that the reputation is necessary because you have reciprocal co uh, cooperation. No. Reputation without. Cooperation doesn't make sense. Yes, it does in cost signaling theory. No, no, no. Because in your cost signaling theory, they are effectively cooperating. So the, 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 the cost signaling is only there to make sure that they will continue cooperating with you. So you assume cooperation. No. I, I don't agree. We, we, we have a disagreement here, but mm -hmm. it can be uh, examined in each case. In the case of babblers, in the case of human species. What is at stake in establishing social bonds? In costly signal theory, the purpose is to establish social bonds with the white friends, the best friends you can get. But the best friends cooperate. No, that's uh, outside of cooperation. You don't need. If, if, no, you, if you, you want, want friends, if it's they a are possibility. With you. It's a possibility. Uh, Barclay says that the the end of the game is in order to find cooperation partners. But this part of the story, you don't need it. The point is to get good partners for whatever purpose. But the partner is a cooperator. That's what you say. It's not required by the model. What yeah. is the point in making a good impression on people who are not in any way going to help you? It's just, it's and yes. The, what, what the point of sociality? It's not a question of helping each other. There are many other purposes. In the case of barbers, it's not a question of help, it's a question of defending the bush against the others. But that is helping each other. Ah, okay, if, if you extend the... So that's no longer cooperation. It is not, it is not cooperation. Defending ah, okay, no, no. So you, 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 you